Okay. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to have Pedro Pedreira from Lisbon here, and he is uh, known to be an expert on multi-Higgs uh, models and everything that is relevant for them. And he will talk today about uh, multi-scalar models and the uh, puzzles and the LHC searches. Please. Thank you very much, Sven, for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, I would say it's always a pleasure to uh, speak in Madrid, but since that I'm actually in Lisbon, uh, I'll just say it's a pleasure to speak to people who are in Spain, probably not all in Madrid. Um, the title of the seminar is incredibly ambitious and I'm going to fail miserably. So um, I'll just uh, go ahead and uh, try to, in the 50 minutes, I'll have uh, to uh, address as many um, of these issues as I can. Um, I'll also say that I believe it is mandatory for any particle physics seminar to have uh, a Monty Python reference, um, a Pulp Fiction reference, a Lord of the Rings reference, and if I get to that, I'll also have a Spielberg reference. And with that, I think I've picked your curiosity. Okay, so very, very basic, if there are any uh, students in the room. We know that matter is composed of elementary particles, and we actually know that they are fermions, and we know that their interactions are ruled by gauge bosons, which might not be true for, gra for the gravitational force, but it is true for the other three forces. Now, um, we have a puzzle with these, all of these theories, which is how do we give them mass? And if there was one ring to rule them all, we have one Higgs to give mass to almost all of them. We know that a photon, for instance, and the gluons have no mass, but to explain the masses of all the other particles, we need to introduce an extra particle in the theory, which is the Higgs boson. And this particle was then predicted in around the 60s, uh, discovered finally in 2012, and we call it the Higgs boson. And as far, as far as we know, it is an elementary particle. It was the latest elementary particle to, uh, to be discovered. And it does a fantastic job, but we like to go beyond it because there's a couple of questions. Actually, there's plenty of questions for which the standard model does not give an answer. And speaking of the Higgs boson, by all means, please, please, please do not call it the God particle. OK, let's please, uh, if you were ever talking to people who are not physicists, just explain that it's not a God particle, not at all. So before we go to multiple Higgs, multiple scalar models, why exactly do we need the Higgs boson? I've already given you the answer, but in fact, uh, in, the, in the abstract, I kind of mentioned that we would be talking about the tools of the trade. And there is something that's not in the books of particle physics, which is the fundamental pr principle of particle physics. If you have a problem that you cannot solve, you invent a new particle. It worked for antimatter. It worked for uh, neutrinos. It worked for the Higgs boson. Uh, it worked for super, uh, actually, no, it didn't work for supersymmetry. Sorry, Sven. Uh, so why do we need the Higgs mechanism? Because without it, we have a huge problem. Um, those gauge symmetry, those gauge interactions I meant are ruled by symmetries. And if we try to put the particles of matter, the, the, the interactions ruled by these symmetries, all the masses of the elementary particles are forced to be zero. So the Higgs boson is the extra particle we put in the theory, and the interactions of all particles with the Higgs uh, is responsible for them acquiring their mass. Now, this is an important issue which needs to be addressed clearly and with, careful, with care. I'm saying the elementary particles, because most of the mass in the universe actually is coming from another mechanism, which is QCD. But um, the Higgs boson, the other thing is, it explains why the particles have masses, but it cannot explain why they have those masses. The masses in the particles in the standard model are pretty much arbitrary numbers that we 
uh, use experiments to tell us what they are. So there is a thing here that is uh, open for uh, interpretation and mostly for discovery. Why does the electron have a mass of 0.511 MeV and why does the top quark mass is 103,000 uh, MeV? Nobody knows. And then there is another issue, which is we know that particles have their mirror images, antiparticles. And the, the, the definition of an antiparticle is actually the CP conjugate of uh, a given field in which you uh, use two operations, charge conjugation and parity conjugation, to transform a particle in its antiparticle, so to speak. Um, and this symmetry, which we put in the, in the model, is actually broken. We know it is broken because we know that there is a huge amount, a huge excess of matter rela related to antimatter. Now, in the standard model, the only source of CP violation comes from the Kabibo Kobayashi Matsukawa uh, matrix. And as far as we know, that amount of CP violation in the CKM matrix is insufficient to explain why there is so much, much more matter than antimatter. And by the way, while we're talking about elementary stuff, how do we know that the universe, not just us, but the universe has such a large excess of matter? Well, it's very simple. This is where we are in the Milky Way, and our closest neighbors, sort of, sorry, astronomers, are in Andromeda. And in the, in the middle between the galaxies, it's not vacuum. There's actually quite a lot of stuff there, low density, but there's quite a number of atoms, nuclei, whatever, floating around. So if Andromeda, for instance, was antimatter, we would be seeing huge explosions of gamma rays uh, occurring in the space between galaxies. So why do we have so much more matter than antimatter in the universe? Nobody knows. And another huge puzzle is we know from observations of the movement of galaxies and the behavior of large um, clusters of galaxies that there is, um, there seems to be a much bigger amount of matter present in the universe than can be accounted uh, using um, visible light um, telescopes as well. We call it dark matter. And what is that dark matter made of? Nobody knows. And this is the beautiful thing about our field is that you don't have to go very far until you stumble upon answers which are crucial to the, to the understanding of the universe, but to which nobody knows the answer. It's simultaneously fascinating and frustrating because it confronts us with our ignorance. The universe is calling us ignorance. So, Monty Python reference. We have been talking about one Higgs, the standard model. It's a phenomenal theory, despite the limitations I showed you. It's impressive how well it works. Some might say that it works too well for its own good. So why should we be interested in expanding the scalar sector of the model? Uh, well, because we wish to provide if, uh, answers to some, if not all, of those questions, um, open questions that I just mentioned. So we discovered this new particle in 2012 at LHC. It has a mass of about 125 GeV. And we have been able to ascertain almost with, with a great degree of certainty that it's a scalar. It has spin zero, could still be um, a mixed state, but that's it's essentially a scalar. And as, for, as far as we know, it's elementary. And as far as we know, and up until now, with the amazing job that our experimental colleagues have been doing, everything is compatible with the standard model um, scalar particle uh, behavior for this thing, which of course is incredibly boring. So I'll be talking mostly about the two Higgs Lebot model, which is my, my expertise, but I'll be many of the things that I'll be talking about with the Higgs model to, to the two HDM also um, have bearing on other models with extra scalars. And I'll be addressing some of those here and there. And if you want to know everything there is to know, not really, about the 2HDM, there is a physics report by some guys which you might uh, want to, to read. So there are plenty of um, extended Higgs sectors. It's not just the 2HDM. Uh, you can take the Higgs double 
droplets and just add some gauge singlets for the, to it. And you can add a real singlet, you can add a complex singlet, you can add two real singlets to it, um, which is a model um, favored by a, a colleague of ours, um, has been uh, Tanya Roberts. So it's either the two real singlet model or the Tanya Roberts standard model, whatever. Uh, and then you can just extend the number of doublets and the sky's the limit. There are three Higgs doublets, four Higgs doublets, and Higgs doublets. The 2HDM has a close uh, relative. It is a 2HDM. It's just called the complex 2HDM because there's a parameter there which is complex and not real, and there's some CP violating aspects to it. And then there is a, um, a not very well known theory called the MSSM, which I'll not be talking about at all because it's essentially killed by experimental data. I keep provoking Sven and he doesn't react. He's being very, very uh, disciplined. And then there are models in which you um, add both doublets and singlets. Um, the end to which the end, for instance, is two Higgs doublets plus a singlet. All of these have uh, interesting aspects to them. Um, all of these have better or worse um, uh, conformity to experimental data. All of these allow you to have extra sources of CP violation or in or, or, um, dark matter candidates. There's, and I apologize if your favorite scalar extension is not here. This is by no means uh, exhaustive. So, there is, however, certain things that as soon as you start playing with the scalar section, you need to uh, be careful. All of these models, as soon as you enlarge the scalar sector, um, you need to, well, essentially ask them the same sort of theoretical and experimental constraints you ask of the standard model. And in terms of theory, for instance, um, you need to ask that the potential be bounded from below. We're going to talk about it in some detail um, just after this slide. The theory must preserve unitarity. Uh, the scalar sector already in the standard model is asked to preserve unitarity. And this is actually one of uh, the, the tools that we used prior to the Higgs discovery to um, know that the Higgs mass could not be too large, it could not be above, I don't remember the exact number, but it was definitely below um, one TV. I think the, the, the final number was something like 700 GeV. And um, in the standard model, your tree level minimum is unique, but in theories with more scalars, it can be uh, not unique. There can be different types of minima, and then you have to assure that the minimum you have is actually stable. And finally, of course, if you are extending the standard model, you have to be able to explain in your model um, how come the standard model works so well. So your model must mimic the standard model in all the good things of the standard model. In particular, um, as soon as you start playing with the parameters of these multiscalar models, one huge um, restriction in the parameter space is used, um, is what you get when you impose electroweak precision data. Finally, uh, your model needs to predict the existence of a 125 GeV spin zero particle that behaves uh, very close to what one expects for the standard model Higgs. We call that the alignment limit. And in models where you have uh, extra doublets, at least, and, and in, in others, um, B physics data, and in particular, uh, the B2S gamma measurements are one of the most relevant sources of restrictions in the parameter space. So whatever model you are taking, there are um, quite a number of things, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, that you have to um, ask your model to obey. Um, there is already a great deal of constraints that we know that all of these and others need to obey. So for instance, uh, in terms of theoretical constraints, what is the bounded from below constraint? Well, the bounded from below is actually simple thermodynamics. Your system needs to have a state of lowest energy somewhere. Um, it, your, uh, the potential, which kind of describes the energy of this, um, of this model, needs to have a minimum somewhere, which means that this potential needs to have overall um, a, a convex shape 
it means that whatever direction you take in these scalars, as soon as you are taking their values to plus infinity, um, the model needs to be bounded from below. It needs to go to plus infinity in all possible directions in field space. They are also called positivity or stability bounds. I don't like the stability one because there's a different issue. But in the standard model, because the potential is so simple, it's just a quadratic and a quartic term, this is a basic, you know, calculus one problem. Um, it just requires, if the potential is convex, that this quartic parameter lambda is positive. That's it. Um, this is already a concern in the standard model. Uh, in models with more uh, complicated scalar sectors, then the conditions become far more complicated. Just to show you just how complicated they are, if you go to the complex, um, complex singlet standard model, it's the standard model, meaning the scalar sector now has the Higgs doublets and um, a complex gauge singlet, which can also be described by two real singlets, chi1 and chi2. I've written here one specific version of this model in which I uh, impose a discrete symmetry just to simplify the model and to prove my point. You see that whereas in the standard model you just have one quartic coupling, now you have six of them, lambda one, two, three, four, five, six, and the necessary and sufficient bounded from below conditions now require you that these three ones, lambda one, two, and three, uh, are positive, and then you have some combinations of those other parameters which are also forced to be positive, so that that uh, potential, that function you see there, whenever one of these scalar couplings, sorry, one of these scalar fields tends to plus infinity, you guarantee that uh, the potential is not going to minus infinity. These, of course, are already some very um, constraining relations you're applying to some of these couplings. So the number of parameters is increasing a lot relative to the standard model, but at least you know that they aren't completely arbitrary. So I've been talking about the two Higgs doubled model, 2HDM for its friends. What do we do in the 2HDM? Well, in terms of scalars, in terms of Higgs scalars, it's a very similar composition, well, it's identical to um, the minimal supersymmetric standard model, even though the MSSM has quite a number of other scalars, in which you took one doublet of the, two, of the standard model, but now you have two. Now these models, th these doublets will have each four real components, phi one, two, three, four, two, uh, two, eight. And now we have two vacuum expectation values, V1 and V2 here. The reason why these models, which were created in 1973 by T.D. Lee, are still so important is because they are a very good laboratory for many beyond standard model phenomena. Um, they can easily be made not to affect the most successful predictions of the SM. Uh, in fact, they have, at least some versions of the model, something we call the decoupling limits, meaning that the low energy version of this model is pretty much indistinguishable or can be made indistinguishable from the standard model, which is both good and bad. They have more scalar particles than the standard model, more spin zero states, which is good because that way we have plenty of stuff to give our experimental colleagues to, to look for. They allow for the possibility of spontaneous CP violation, so an extra source of possible baryon uh, asymmetry. And they can also be modified in some versions to account for dark matter. They can give you very good dark matter candidates. So um, that's all of that possibility comes with a, a price with two Higgs doublets. Well, with one Higgs doublet, you have two real independent parameters. Here, um, you have this horrible thing I've just written. You have seven quartic couplings, three um, quadratic ones. Some of these can be complex. If you count them all, the real and the complex, it seems like you have 14 independent real parameters. Actually, we just have 11. Let's not get into that. 
Now, this model is perfectly okay, but since the 70s, the one that really interests more people is we introduced a discrete Z2 symmetry here, which is just a flip in the sign of one of the doublets. For instance, phi2 goes to minus phi2, which you'll notice that it eliminates all lambda 7 and lambda 6 terms. It would eliminate also this M12 term. We reintroduce this M12 term. Um, it becomes a soft breaking of this uh, Z2 symmetry. Um, essentially, in order to have what I called um, the, um, the decoupling limit. The reason why one introduces this Z2 symmetry is to reduce the number of parameters in the model. And also, as soon as you consider the full Lagrangian, this will have a very uh, significant and useful impact in the fermion sector by eliminating um, large uh, tree-level flavor-changing neutral currents. So the softly broken uh, Z2 potential is much simpler. All of the couplings can be made real, for instance, uh, with at least that's a choice. It only has eight parameters. And uh, as soon as you um, take the fermions into account, then you have several possibilities, the two most interesting and well the two most common ones are what we call model one in which only one of the doublets couples to all fermions and model two the analogous of supersymmetry where phi two one of the doublets couples to up quarks and phi one to down quarks and leptons there's other possibilities but this is a consequence of that z2 symmetry i mentioned and um, the reason why we like this uh, the absence of these flavor changing neutral currents is because we know from experiment that these things, if they ex exist, are extremely small. If they are extremely small, might as well give them a natural way to be zero via a symmetry. So, as I said, um, and this is for a particular case of CP conservation, you have more states to discover. Uh, so, instead of just the H that typically we call the, the 125 GV state the lightest of these guys. It's not mandatory. There are other possibilities. This would be the standard model like scalar. It's CP even, but there's a heavier brother, capital H, which is also CP even. And then there's also a neutral pseudo scalar, so CP odd state, usually called A. And the reason why one of them is a, two of them are scalars and others are pseudo scalars, how do we know this? Well, you have stuff like, for instance, that these two guys can decay to two Zs and two Ws, but the pseudo scalar, at least at three level, will not decay to two Zs and two Ws. There are the differences, but that's that. We also have a charged scalar present, um, which is very important for this model. And also, as I said, and I'm going to be talking about this shortly, we can have a version of this, which is inert, uh, meaning where um, this Z2 symmetry, which I just mentioned, is taken exact, not softly broken, and it provides a very good dark matter model. So just some notation and very quickly just to um, show you some very generic things about the 2HDM. Um, well, both doublets can be parameterized in a different manner than I just did. Uh, we have the real um, CP, the, the real components of the of the doublets, the real and neutral, the imaginary and neutral, and the charged ones. We have the two VES, V1 and V2. In order for us to have the correct electroweak symmetry breaking, V1 squared plus V2 squared needs to be equal to 246 GV squared. We define an angle beta such that its tangent is um, the VEV2 divided by the VEV1. And those two CP even states, which I just mentioned, are linear combinations of these rho, real, and neutral components of both doublets. They tend to mix. This angle alpha, without lots of generality, can be taken between plus or minus pi over 2. And this angle alpha is actually the diagonalization of this two by two CP even mass matrix. And these two angles, alpha and beta, alpha the diagonalization angle of this matrix, and beta 
the um, ratio, the tan beta, the ratio of the deaths, um, have a very important role in the phenomenology of the 2HDM because all of the couplings of um, the Higgs particles, the scalar particles to fermions or gauge bosons can be written in terms of alpha and beta. For instance, um, if you compute the coupling of uh, the little Higgs to a couple of Zs or a couple of Ws in the 2HDM, it's identical to that coupling in the standard model multiplied by a very simple function of beta and alpha, sine beta minus alpha. The same thing happens for capital H and whatnot. And in terms of couplings to fermions, I mentioned the two more popular models, type one and type two. There's two others, left and specific and flipped. You have four variations here for possibilities, depending on how each of the couplings, uh, each of each, how each of the doublets couples to fermions. And um, just to scare you when you write the Lagrangian of the interactions between scalars and fermions, um, the standard model couplings to each fermion are modified by these uh, psi coefficients for little h or capital H for A. And of course, you can work it out in your heads um, and in 10 seconds that clearly these coupling modifiers are obviously these numbers. And um, if you don't agree with that, please do yourself the calculation. Um, but more than the specific values and the specific combinations of cosines and sines, you see that everything is dependent on alpha and beta. So it's a very simple description of the phenomenology. And when it comes to the theoretical bounds that we have now in the 2HDM, like I mentioned, the potential has to be bounded from below. We know from some time ago uh, that, that the necessary and sufficient conditions uh, for those five quartic couplings uh, need to obey these conditions up here. The theory must also be unitary, meaning whenever you're considering um, scattering, arbitrary scattering between scalar fields, um, essentially you, you need to preserve uh, probability equals one. Uh, so this is well known, for instance, for the standard model. It has been adapted for the 2HDM and for other models. For the 2HDM, we are lucky. We have these exact expressions, which are necessary and sufficient. If you try to generalize these things for other models, for the 3HDM, for instance, the bounded from below conditions are no longer um, known in full generality. We have necessary conditions, but we don't have necessary and sufficient conditions. It is something that we need to be uh, to take into account. And and by the way, these these are the simple 2HDM conditions um, because this is the case of the potential with Z2 symmetry. Uh, the necessary and sufficient conditions are also known for the most generic. Um, to HDM. They were obtained by a colleague of ours called Igor Ivanov, a very, very clever individual. Um, but um, then they become unwieldy. They are absolutely horrible and only people like Igor can actually understand them. Not, not really. They, they are useful, um, but they are very, very horrible. So in terms, for instance, of uh, the constraints coming from B physics, they're very important for the HDM, for the MSSM, whenever you have more doublets, the most relevant one is definitely the B2S gamma. You see here the green allowed space between these two um, upper plots, type one and type two. And you see roughly, it's not exact, that you need to be above 10 beta equals one. It's more complicated than that. And for um, type two, also roughly, about 10 beta equals one, but notice that cut there, a lower bound on the charged Higgs mass, which is here in the horizontal. This is coming from B2S gamma. It's a very strong constraint um, in, um, in models, uh, both type two and flipped. Um, if you take the more recent calculation of these observables, um, it's actually being argued that this lower bound should actually be moved to 800 GeV. It's a very, very serious constraint. And of course, this is good because as soon as you plug in these constraints, this means that the size of your parameter space is smaller and your theory becomes more predictive. So 
for any students in the in the in the audience, how do I make a model with a dark matter candidate? Well, here you have it in uh, five steps. Four. Um, you have to choose a discrete or continuous symmetry. Uh, it has to be global, so no extra gauge bosons. Um, probably I can make it work also with a local symmetry, but it doesn't matter. And you need to make sure that that symmetry is preserved after spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay, so you have a symmetry in the Lagrangian and the vacuum preserves that symmetry. And bang. Your model now has a preserved quantum number. You can call it the darkness quantum number, why not? And because this number has to be conserved in all interactions, this means that any normal observable particles, the ones that we know, um, can only have decays involving dark matter particles, that one dark one normal particle can decay to two ones. We have to be careful with these ones, for instance, because the Higgs could decay to two dark matter particles. Or one dark matter particle can only decay to a normal dark matter uh, particle, a, a normal particle and a dark matter particle. And this in particular tells you that the lightness of these dark matter particles then is kinematically forbidden from decaying, and then you have a stable state. Then you need to take your theory and verify that the parameters of your theory actually conform to um, this considerable um, experimental constraints you already have from dark matter searches. And an example of this in the 2HDM is the Z2 symmetric model. Uh, now, I've showed you three versions of the 2HDM, so it's normal that uh, at this point you've lost yourself a little. So let me just go back. The soft broken, you'll notice, has that extra term there. Okay, so this is the soft broken. Uh, the global, uh, the, the most general one, has all of these horrible things. And now I introduce the Z2, and this is the exact Z2. So these two guys vanish, these two terms vanish, and the soft breaking also vanishes. Now, this model then, you didn't reintroduce your um, soft breaking term. Uh, it only has seven independent parameters. Now, uh, only one of the doublets couples to fermions. And this automatically tells you that uh, the second doublet that is here does not couple to fermions because we choose a vacuum which preserves the Z2 symmetry. Uh, this means that the second doublet also does not couple, it has no triple uh, gauge couple triple couplings to gauge bosons. So none of these guys, um, you know, none of these states from the, the second doublet can decay to two Zs, for instance. And so this gives you naturally ruled by a symmetry, uh, very good dark matter candidates. And typically one takes the lowest mass, the lowest neutral guy, both scalar or pseudo-scalar, either scalar or pseudo-scalar. Oh, look. Mark Scher is present. I wonder who sent him an invitation. Um, and then you have um, a very good dark matter candidate here, which we take, typically take as the, the lightest neutral guy. So why should we bother? Because of all these reasons why I told you this is a very simple, very elegant dark matter candidate. The parameter space, and this is good, is already very, very tightly constrained both from uh, relic density uh, data and uh, relic abundance and direct searches, I think. Uh, but uh, precisely because the model is already so constrained, this makes it very likely that, you know, if something, um, if, if our observations become more um, um, precise, we can even exclude it. And this is good because currently we have too many models and not enough data. So, second uh, Lord of the Rings reference, um, my, um, my personal taste in these things is to study the vacuum stability of the 2HDM and actually of multiple scalar models. This is how I pay my bills, essentially. And um, the 2HDM has a very interesting vacuum structure because you can have what I like to call the normal minimum, because both doublets now have real VEVs. 
Um, then you have the charge breaking minimum. This is not possible in the standard model, by the way, uh, because reasons which I don't have time to explain. But uh, now you have here, for instance, an upper value for one of these guys, an upper bound VEV, and this breaks the electroweak symmetry. So this VEV actually gives mass to the photon. And you can also have, as I've been saying, spontaneous CP violation in which there is a relative sign, a relative phase between both VEVs. And this can actually break CP, can. It's not mandatory, it's more complicated than that. So we have possible coexistence of these stationary points. Would it be any problem if some of these minima were to coexist? Well, the answer is, might be. Um, for instance, you could have something like this, a local minimum which, you know, has the correct electroweak symmetry breaking and you're living there, but there is a global minimum which actually breaks charge. And you could have tunneling, I know that's not tunneling, but it looks better, to the, the lowest minimum for which the photon would have a mass and this would be a catastrophe. Uh, if that tunneling time would actually be inferior to the edge of the universe. So now the curious thing is, um, this is a very beautiful thing in, this, in the 2 HDM. You can prove analytically, there is this theorem that um, some guys actually proved in 2004, that if a normal minimum exists, then this picture I did here is impossible. If a normal minimum exists and any charge breaking is lying above this guy, okay? And it's actually a saddle point. You can prove it analytically. Um, the difference between the value of the potential and the charge breaking stationary point and the normal minimum is guaranteed to be positive if the normal is a minimum. And, and this also happens, by the way, uh, for uh, the possible coexistence with a CP breaking sad, uh, stationary point. If there is a normal minimum, then the CP stationary point lies above it. You could have a CP breaking minimum, but then the normal one would lie above it. This is not so, for instance, regarding charge breaking for SUSY. For SUSY, you can have possible charge and color breaking minimum. But here, it's very nice that the stability of the model at tree level is automatically guaranteed. And even though the model is from um, 1973, this was unknown until 1974, until, uh, sorry, <laughs> 2004. It's one of the situations where it seems that this model has given everything uh, it should be, but uh, we keep finding new stuff about it. Uh, then there is another possibility, which you could have two different normal minima. The, V1 and V2 are such that V1 squared plus V2 squared is 246 squared. But there is a possibility that you have two minima with different depths in which also normal uh, VEVs occur, real VEVs occur, but which for which the, the value of the double mass, for instance, would be completely different. And now this is different. Now they can coexist. And you could have the situation in which we are lying here and the W has a mass of 80 and the top has a mass of 173. And then suddenly you could tunnel to also electroweak breaking, but for which the VEVs would be different. And this is not something that we can choose the parameters. Um, this is something that occurs very seldom, but every now and again, you choose parameters such that it occurs. We call it, with tongue in cheek, the panic vacuum. And uh, blah, blah, blah. Also, we have an analytical expression for why this must occur or when this can occur. And given that I have 12 minutes, let's start talking about. Um, more I give you 15. Give me 15. How generous you are. Thank you very much. Um, so um, these very nice analytical expressions that we have for the 2HDM are by no means the rule, okay? So if we try to enlarge the scalar sector for a three Higgs doublet model, for instance, for models with singlets, um, we have to be careful because sometimes we do not have these analytical expressions. Vacuum stability is no longer guaranteed as it is in the 2HDM. So we need to be very careful when we're doing parameter scans of these models um, 
to make sure that a, a combination of parameters, which seems to give a good phenomenology, is actually in agreement both with all theory constraints and all experimental constraints. And by the way, still talking about vacuum stability, this simple picture, for instance, in which you have these uh, um, tunnelings, this really is only problematic if the tunneling time between the two minima is inferior to the age of the universe. And this um, is a very complicated calculation. It can be done, but it has to be done numerically. Um, and for instance, for the 2HDM, we get these nice color plots. My Italian colleagues um, said that they look like flags of a new country. Uh, we baptized this country Decadonia because it's all of this has to do with the decay from one vacuum to the other. And this is for a, a specific region of parameter space. Let me just show you briefly that um, all of these points are in particular um, um, possible, but out of all of these regions of parameter space, here you have the lambda five coupling as a function of the pseudoscalar mass, pseudoscalar mass as the soft breaking coupling. Um, uh, the only actual dangerous points for which the tunneling time between two coexisting minima is inferior to the age of the universe for this specific values of the couplings here would be the red bands, okay? So all the other couplings would a priori be okay, okay? Conceptually, it's not very um, interesting to know that your model has a deeper minimum somewhere, but a priori, you would be okay. Uh, and this can also be applied to the next to 2HDM. And there's some uh, interesting um, implications for the parameter space of this model. Here, for instance, um, just uh, this is um, the gamma gamma um, Higgs signal strength, which I'll define in a couple of slides. Uh, so this is what's observed at the LHC as a function of a charge Higgs mass. So for instance, if you had a charge Higgs mass of uh, 400 GeV and this mu would be a, a bit above one, so 1.05 or 1.10, this model would actually be excluded because um, the theory constraints would tell you that, hey, there you are in a position where you actually have a dangerous minimum that is tunneling to a deeper minimum. So this is also valid, even though here we have to do a lot of numerics uh, in more complex uh, cases. So let's now talk about something which is not sufficiently appreciated by many people, I think both by theorists and sometimes by experimentalists. By experimentalists don't realize just how important it is what they are doing. We are in a situation currently in which the LHC is producing fantastic, fantastically boring results. They are fantastically precise, but they are incredibly boring because they don't show any real signs of deviations from the standard model. There are people like myself, <coughs> Sven, for instance, who like to look at weird blips in data and look, oh, there's something here. We are chasing ambulances and this is okay. We should be able to um, be able to, if something happens in the future, be able to explain it. But currently it has to be said that everything is very standard model-like. So the, assuming that one is not going to reach the end of the LHC run without finding new particles directly, there is something extremely important which needs to be done, which is to measure the Higgs um, parameters with incredible precision. Uh, and so LHC co collaborations, to quote Churchill, keep buggering on, okay? We need you to keep buggering on because when we reach the high luminosity LHC, and I took this from uh, some SMS, CMS um, data uh, publication, you see that, you know, you look at these plots here and uh, the green ones are essentially where we are right now um, for the values of these mu's. These are actually mu's, mu minus one, I think. Yeah, they are the deviations of the mu's. 
So the mu's are uh, the ratio of production cross-section times branching ratio in your favorite model divided by standard model. I mean, for the experimentalists, they are what they're measuring divided by the standard model expectation. For a theorist is, this would be what I predict for the two HDM, and this is what uh, the standard model gives. In the SM, all of these mu's would actually be one. We find them very close to one. We have deviations of 10, in some cases, maybe 20%. And you notice that uh, for the high Lumi LHC with 300 or 3000 inverse Fentobarn, these error bars will get increasingly smaller. And what can we do for these with these um, extreme precision um, um, results when we get them? Well, for instance, and this is just one amongst many, many possibilities, uh, the Higgs has decays to two photons. This is actually one of the discovery channels. And this is a very interesting channel because the only standard model diagrams contributing to it are the first three I'm showing there. All the others you'll notice involve um, a dashed line going around in the loop. And this is a charged case. In supersymmetry, for instance, there would be other contributions. Uh, and so this is actually a very sensitive probe to uh, loop effects. It, it, it's the astonishing thing that when we discovered the Higgs at the LHC, it was actually a two loop, so to speak, um, effect because it was uh, most of the cross section comes from a loop involving gluons, and this decay is a loop involving um, the Higgs. So these diagrams involving a charged Higgs in the 2HGM are not present in the standard model, and they can give, for some regions of parameter space, sizable contributions to uh, the Higgs decay wave. And here I just played a game. I generated in my code a bunch of numbers which comply with um, the current precision data. The uh, black and... Um, blue, sorry, the black and red lines are the 300 and 300, 3000 inverse Fentobard expected precisions on mu gamma gamma. And I played this number. Let's say that except for the mu gamma gamma, everything is centered around one. So everything is standard model like except mu gamma gamma. And I just took it centered around 1.1. Again, this is just an example to show what can be done. Uh, the blue points are everything I generated. The yellow points are what one would have if one were to have the 300 inverse amount precision in every news um, around one except mu gamma gamma. And the green is with 3000 inverse Fendelbar. And what you see here is that for instance, in the middle of these two black bars, which are the expected 3000 inverse Fentobarn precision on mu gamma gamma, there are no green points, which would tell you that for model two, in this situation, we could actually exclude model two with this precision, okay? Again, if you're telling me that this is likely that we'll have a 10% deviation in mu gamma gamma, who knows? But the interesting thing is this precision could tell you uh, something as basic as we are going to rule this model out. And um, if you do the same thing for type one, for instance, you find the interesting thing that, again, you would exclude everything. But for low masses of the charged Higgs, you could still have um, you know, um, allowed points for type one. But this is interesting because then you would be predicting uh, a low mass for the charge state. Um, again, why around 1.1 and not 1? If you put it around 1, you'll have absolutely no exclusion. You'll have exclusion of some parts of the parameter space, but not of the model as itself. Ah, an Oscar Wilde reference. I had forgotten about this one. Um, the very um, indirect effect of the the, the nice precision we already have on the mu's for little h on sigma times branching ratio for the Higgs boson is that this is also already telling us what is not allowed for the other scalars. For instance, CMS has value, this is 
almost certainly been, this has definitely been updated, but doesn't matter because the point stands, um, for searches in, um, you know, two Z resonances. So essentially, you have to be below uh, this um, red band, whatever you wish to call it. Uh, and if you now try to let me, you know, take the current Little Higgs data and uh, generate a bunch of 2HDM plots and see what uh, the 2HDM is predicting for the production of the heavy CP even Higgs, and then it's decaying, it's decayed to 2Z and then four leptons. The yellow line is sort of this upper yellow line here, just to, just to guide the eye. And the blue points are everything that's allowed. The density of points is not really uh, meaningful. But now, if I take these red points and ask something very simple, I ask, and uh, I'm far better than this now, I ask that uh, all of these points need to predict a little Higgs 125 GV guy for which the mu's are within 30% of the standard model. And I'm already way better than 30%. And you see just how many of the blue points vanish, okay? The precision on little Higgs uh, is already curtailing a lot of the available parameter space that otherwise you might have. This is important. Of course, we still have quite a lot of allowed points for which you're not nowhere near the current experimental sensitivity, but the current Higgs data is already seriously limiting your, um, um, uh, oops, sorry, my, my chronometer just told me my time is finished plus five. Um, and if you look at it for other channels, you'll see similar things, although, of course, not all observables. You could still have, and this is nice, you can still also use the current uh, searches to, um, to put constraints on your model. For instance, the searches for both the scalar and the heavier pseudoscalar uh, to tau tau, for instance, will eliminate portions of your parameter space. So the searches are already excluding also the parameter stuff. And very, very, very quickly, some of the stuff I have been working on recently, not all of this is theory. We have uh, these models, so let's go ambulance chasing and try to fit uh, excesses that our experimental colleagues do not like the call excesses. But whenever a theoretician sees something like this, oh, it's going above the yellow band. That's an excess. There's something there. And it's going above the yellow band, both on uh, the BB production cross-section and on uh, the uh, gluon fusion production cross-section around the same value of the mass that's clearly a pseudo scalar because it's decaying to zh and um, this can actually be fitted in the 2hdm in something called the wrong sign limit the wrong sign limit is just what you get in the 2hdm type 2 in which you have the possibility of the Higgs coupling to bottom Clarks actually being very similar to the standard model in absolute value, but having the opposite sign for several reasons, which I don't have to, time to explain. For instance, um, there was actually at some point, some pre senior preliminary data, which actually seemed to favor very, very slightly. Um, uh, the, uh, the bottom coupling being negative instead of positive. This has gone the way of the dodo now. But you could, in the wrong sign limit, around 400 GeV, almost fit both the BB and the glue glue state. Um, unfortunately, our CMS colleagues have uh, published also their data, and the 400 GeV um, excess is no longer present there. You could have some discussions about sensitivities, but again, this has uh, seemingly go away. Ask Sven and he'll tell you about uh, the most beautiful excess. It's, it's actually a lovely, lovely excess and uh, around involving two photons for a lower mass, 95, 98 GeV, which um, can also be explained in um, theories with more scalars. Uh, but the important thing here is, okay, we're not claiming discovery. We were not claiming discovery. This game is important for us to realize just how much 
uh, our favorite models can or cannot explain. If tomorrow there is an excess, these are sort of stress tests in our, in our data. And by the way, I do think that ZH and WH uh, production channels um, are very, very possibly interesting because one of them could be, if there is some excess, this, the possibility of a, um, a pseudo scalar and the other one a charge scalar. Uh, then uh, very recently we did this uh, version of the NEM to HDM with both CP violation in the scalar sector and dark matter, but the CP violation, this was more like a theory exercise to see if we could do it. The CP violation was all in the dark sector. And the title of the paper was CP in the dark. And I managed to uh, uh, get that through my German collaborators, <coughs> Maggie, without her realizing it was actually a Lord of the Rings reference. Um, I won't have time to, to discuss it. It's very interesting. It's something that would rel actually uh, have some contribution to a trilinear, sorry, uh, triple gauge couplings, anomalous triple gauge couplings. Unfortunately, the sensitivity to discover these things is beyond our current dreams, but it's an interesting um, model with both CP violation and um, dark matter. And the CP violation is actually in the dark sector. And given that there is much more dark sector than what we actually know, uh, this could be interesting. Uh, and finally, these three level flavor changing neutral currents I mentioned uh, are um, problematic, but there are models in which with some extra symmetries, they can be made naturally small. And if they exist, uh, and with Luis Lavora here in Lisbon, we were trying a model to explain the strong CP problem. We could uh, have interesting stuff in which some of these particles, uh, the extra scalars, could actually have exotic decays for a single top, a single top and a light um, up type quark. They would be rare, but this I think would be a very, very clear signature because you'd have a very a, a top uh, jet and essentially in the opposite hemisphere, a very light non-bottom jet, something to think. So conclusions, it's, it's an exciting field. We have to um, fight the feeling that everything has been done because the Higgs has been discovered and we haven't yet discovered anything else. We are being far too impatient. It took us 50 years to discover the Higgs. Um, this is not supposed to be easy. The next particles, if they exist, of course, uh, can take a lot of time. But the important thing is the precision data of the Higgs towards the end of the LHC and beyond will tell us maybe indirect evidence of the presence of extra physics of new particles. And there is something uh, that, um, you know, we are facing the unknown and um, we need better ideas. All of these are ideas which have decades. Why not new stuff? Definitely, as long as it works. And uh, I promised a Spielberg reference and here it is. Um, the LHC is a fantastic machine. But there is something which is very clear, even with the LHC, this will not be enough. We need a new collider, um, not to play around, but to find um, what's on around the corner. If the LHC finds nothing new, um, okay, it's just because it didn't go far enough. We will need a bigger collider, definitely. And hopefully it won't eat us. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for this uh, comprehensive overview and these uh, couple of uh, teasers what might be out there. And uh, let me make just one remark. I also, I, I fully agree that uh, looking at an axis somewhere, even if it's slide and see what, uh, how it can be realized, it's not only ambulance chasing, yeah? It, as you said correctly, one has to test the model, what it can or what it cannot explain or which type of model could explain which type of excess also to be ready in case something really comes up, yeah? These are really worthwhile exercises, I think. Good. 
Are there any questions? For... I have one, may I? Yes, Maria Jose, go on. Um, hi, Pedro. Hi. 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 If, if, if you guys could uh, uh, turn oh, your yes. cameras on, that would be lovely. Yeah, let me let me see if I know how to do it. <laughs> um, but if not, no uh, problem. Yes, yes. <laughs> Mark knows. Mark knows. Yes, very nice. Hi, Maria. Hi, Pedro. Well, I'm curious about one thing, in, among other things, because I'm working also on that with precisely with Sven. Um, what is your opinion on the future sensitivity uh, regarding triple his couplings, in particular uh, the couplings of the uh, light his to the heavy hisses? I, I, I tell you that because as far as I know and as far as I have read in the literature, there are not much sensitivity uh, in future LAC and one really should go not really to bigger collider but to linear collider, to E plus E minus collider in order to really uh, touch that part of the to his double model. The trilinear couplings are very uh, difficult to measure. They're very difficult to measure. Um, to, um, to answer your question, let me go to my uh, extra slides. Currently, this is the channel that most theorists are excited. Uh, the double Higgs production is, um, well, it's something that we haven't mentioned. We, yes. we see nothing about, ah, this one, this is double Higgs production. Ah. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. we're showing a different one. Yeah. Um, so, um, essentially, um, we have measured the VEV, 246. We have measured the mass of the Higgs, 125. So we know these two parameters, but, this model, and so, yeah, the potential is reconstructed. We have everything. Well, not really, because there is something that this predicts, which we haven't yet measured, which is actually the Higgs self-interaction. It should be exactly the value of lambda that we know. Now, our experimental colleagues are doing a fantastic job about measuring this trilinear coupling between the three uh, Higgses, even though they keep telling us that probably they won't be able to reach standard model sensitivities before the end of the LHC, we know that they are just playing hard to get, right? Because they want us to say, oh, you are so fantastic that you could actually do it. Now, if tomorrow they would actually discover an excess or a default in this particular channel, this would be an indication for what uh, you were talking, Maria, that maybe there is something here, another particle, and this is just one of the many uh, possible diagrams in which you could have this. Um, I am currently working with um, Rui Santos and Maggie Mühleitner, uh, Absalom Marib, on um, in, in quite a number of these multi-scalar models, um, what would be the impact for double Higgs production? Um, you are quite correct that the sensitivity is a challenge. Um, these processes are incredibly rare. And, and by the way, uh, there is a very simple reason why the sensitivity is a challenge. The preferred, these channels are, sorry, the cross sections uh, and the branching ratio, the, bra the, pro the, ah, the branching ratios uh, can be small if you have capital H to, to two others, just the standard model cross section is small. And then the preferred channels for their searches would be each of these guys decaying to two bottoms. So you have a final B uh, quark state and uh, it's a challenge. Um, I cannot give you a number uh, why, oh no, I'm, I'm pretty sure that we'll uh, reach sensitivity or not. Um, I will take you at your words that uh, a circular collider um, would not do a good, as good a job as a linear one. And thank you for telling me that because mm -hmm. now I need to tell Rui, Maggie and Absalam, hey, um, those guys at my seminar told me something. We need to check that. Mm -hmm. uh, what? Can I comment? You yes, yes, please. You, no, finish, sorry, finish. No, no just, just to say that um, one of the issues we are finding with these things is obviously as soon as you put um, a heavy guy decaying here, 
common wisdom will be, oh, it's a heavy resonance. So the, the production times branching, the, the decay will overwhelm everything. And you're going to see a nice peak um, over a continuum of the standard model. And that's not so. Sorry, that's not necessarily so. If you're lucky, that will happen. Um, however, there are two issues. A, there's quite a number of, there's a vast regions of parameter space in these models, 2HDM, N2HDM, you name it, for which actually this branching ratio, capital H to two little Higgses, can be quite small. And then there is another issue that in these models, the continuum can actually be changed as well. So be, for instance, uh, if you have some change in, in this coupling, for instance, in uh, beyond standard model Higgses or in some of these, we must remember that in the standard model, this process is a negative interference. Uh, a little change in these couplings can get you very far away from the standard model value. And, uh, and so um, this, this kind of becomes a black box in which you have a final number for a cross section. And um, what exactly is it? Are you just making a change on this coupling or are you making a change on this one? The, and the handicap, sorry, of LSC, as you know, is that uh, the dominant um, production channel is coming from gluon gluon. But the point which I always comment when I listen to these kind of arguments is that there is an additional way of producing this heat, which is via WW fusion, as you know. And in that case, you can uh, isolate better the sensitivity to the lambdas. I, al I, I always comment this because I know that at, at LSC is really dominated by gluon gluon, but it's not negligible, and it, I'm sure it will be a study for the LHC also, uh, the sensitivity to these lambdas via WW, the production of two hisses via WW fusion, because they, they come with additional missing energy and so on, and jets uh, in the forward direction and so on, and that could access to the lambdas, not only the ones you are mentioning, but also the other lambdas, like two heavies, to, uh, with respect to one his, I mean, couple to uh -huh. one, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, these kind of uh, strategies are the ones that are done in the linear colliders because then you don't have the gluon gluon fusion and you have the WW scattering as a unique and dominant uh, channel to produce the two hisses. And that is something that I know that is being studied. We are studying with Sven uh, that in the linear colliders. And at the LAC, I don't know, because uh, this is why I asked you <laughs> at the LAC, what, what are the prospects? I don't know, but it's, now I'm curious. I'll, uh... Sorry, I, am, uh, I think we are using too much time, my question. Please. Oh, that's a very interesting question, of course, <laughs> but <laughs> also very <laughs> difficult to answer one, obviously. <laughs> are there other questions or comments for Pedro? Let me ask a more general one. Um, you were introducing, of course, the four types of the Twix doublet model. And also you concentrated mostly on type one and type two, and also my papers were concentrated on those. But um, I always have the impression this is some unjustified prejudice. Uh, or do you see any theoretical reason why type one, type two should be preferred over three and four? Or... Um, th th there's absolutely no reason. Um, the thing is that they're actually split into, um, into category, categories. Um, if you just look at the quark sector uh, then type one and what we call, I think it's type three or leptin specific behave pretty much in the same manner. Yeah and type two and flipped the same way. Now, um, the leptin specific and the flipped have um, specific lepton behavior, which is very, very useful for some things. So definitely, as soon as you start looking into the lepton sector, then um, you will want to um, arrange to, to, to go to the other two. But as long as you're only in the hadron sector, um, so, you know, they, they fall under these two categories. I should also mention, given that uh, Professor Mark Scher is present, that there is a version 
or an, an extra version called the muon specific model um, which has uh, a very nice flavor violating symmetry without um, flavor changing neutral currents which uh, was a surprise to me we did this uh, cute paper a year ago or something um, which allows for the possibility of an enhancement or suppression of the muon production, um, sorry, of the muon branching ratios of, um, of the Higgs uh, of the 125 GV state. So my, my general answer to you, uh, Sven, is this is not necessarily um, a prejudice um, in the sense that if you're only worried, and, that, and at this point, uh, I mean, with the tau tau branching ratios of the Higgs already measured, uh, this becomes uh, an issue. We need to start looking at um, what exactly is being predicted for, for the couplings to the tau. Mm -hmm. And in the future, when we have the muons also with sufficient precision, this will allow us then to discriminate between the several models. Um, but if you look at other stuff, um, I'm not sure about neutrinos, but the Shini Kanemura has plenty, plenty of papers where he considers specifically mm. phenomenological aspects of type three and type four. Okay. I think Mark wants to add something. Yeah. yeah just to, to answer Sven's question, um, I think to some degree, the reason people prefer type one to lepton specific and type two to flip is an old hangover from SU5 when the downs and the leptons were in the same representation. Uh -huh. and, and so that kind of lets people think that they ought to kind of go the same way. Okay. I think that's just an old fashioned prejudice. So I don't... Maybe I'm too young for this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. It's a very interesting argument. Very good. Okay. Are there any other questions for Pedro? No? Okay, then uh, thanks a lot for this. Thank you very time. much for the invitation, Sven. Thank you very much for the questions. And, um, you know, keep safe. It's the only yeah, thing yeah. I can tell you. We'll yeah. meet again in 3D. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Oh, in 3D, but in person, okay? Yes. I don't want holograms. <laughs> I want to go to Madrid and eat uh, ham, okay? Yes, we will do that. We will do that. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye.